الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته First thing I would like to say after praising Allah and thanking him is to all of the young brothers and the young sisters sitting here Alhamdulillah I'm already proud of you. Not by listening and sitting quietly and attentively and being respectful and extra respectful the things that your teachers and your instructors want from you. But I'm already proud of you first and foremost by just being Muslim and remaining upon Islam and being in the masjid walillahi alhamd. Now some of you you may say well I was born a Muslim. My mother's a Muslim, my father's a Muslim, my grandfather's a Muslim, my whole lineage, my background is all Muslim. I'm a young kid, what else am I going to do? There are many young children in the United States that run away from home. There are many young children in the United States, no matter what their parents do for them or against them, give them the world or beat them like dogs, they still don't listen and they still don't obey. And they may hate what their parents are doing and what their parents are practicing. But the sheer fact that you guys are sitting in the masjid learning the Qur'an, whether you're the best student or not the best student, but the sheer fact that you're a Muslim, and you're not forced to be a Muslim, you could do other things even at a young age. It's not far-fetched in the United States. So the sheer fact that you're sitting in and you're listening, you've already made me proud, alhamdulillah. You've already made me proud, and I mean that from my heart. And it's difficult being a young Muslim, period. Let alone being a young Muslim in the United States in 2019. And you have many challenges and many problems and obstacles and pitfalls, things that we didn't have when we were your age. We had problems, we had difficulties. I was always a Muslim, I was born and raised Muslim. But things are very different in the modern world today with regards to technology and social media and the challenges of Islam. We know that the world was never the same, let alone the United States or the Western countries after 9-11. 9-11 changed many things, changed the dunya. The world was different after 9-11 for Muslims and for non-Muslims. So if that was how many years ago, imagine now, things are different, okay? Things are different. So you have many obstacles and challenges that we didn't have when we were growing up. And alhamdulillah, you guys being here is enough to make me proud, walillahi alhamd. I was once a young kid, I was once a child. We didn't always sit still. We didn't always keep quiet 100%. We played around, we threw crayons and stuck gum under the tables and different things like this, all right? We, we were children once as well. So I'm not expecting you to sit here and it to be totally silent, full of sakina. I know that you're kids, but it's very important that you listen to your teachers. And it's very important that you respect your teachers. And it's very important is that you develop good character from a young age. For who you are tomorrow or who you're going to be tomorrow, you're becoming that today. What you're going to be tomorrow is being formed and forged today. The good habits that you get now, inshallah, will be good habits that you'll have when you become a teenager, and when you become an adult, and a young man, and a young woman. And the bad habits that you pick up, and from the worst of those bad habits, is disrespect. No one likes a disrespectful person. No one likes someone that doesn't know how to respect someone who's above them, older than them, who is in authority. And don't think that you're going to go to the NBA. Don't think you're going to be this great basketball player. Don't think that you're going to be this rapper or dancer or singer or an actor or whatever other thing that kids want to be today. And you don't have respect. Talent isn't enough. It's not good enough. It's much more than talent. You have to have respect. You have to have humility. And you have to have hard work. And these good habits and this moral character is only, as I said, formed and forged now and not tomorrow. So it's very important advice for each and every one of us is that showing respect to your teacher is a manifestation of showing respect to yourself. Showing respect to your teacher is a way that you show that you really respect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's because the only reason why he's a teacher is because of Allah. And the only reason why the teacher is so special is because of Allah. He's teaching you the Qur'an. Khayrukum man ta'allam al-Qur'ana wa alamahu. 
The best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. So the teacher isn't special because of what he or she looks like. The teacher isn't no one special because of their blood or their skin or their hair. That means nothing. That means nothing in the sight of Allah. In actuality, if you really get down deep, as we say, to the nitty gritty, if you ever think about it, even in the worldly life, blood and lineage doesn't mean that much. Really doesn't mean that much in reality. And that's because there were countless great men and women in all fields and aspects and spheres of life that came from the unorthodox, untraditional background. And they excelled. And their names live to this day. And their legacy and their fame or their infamy is immortal to this day. And they were of different backgrounds and of different lineages. One of the wisest men in the history of the Western world is who? Aesop. And Aesop was a slave. He was a Greek slave. How many people who, the man who owned Aesop, or the woman who owned Aesop, the people that were above and beyond and bigger than Aesop, do you hear their names? Their fables? Their wise tales? No, you don't. But you hear Aesop's fables. And he was a slave. So his lineage didn't really mean anything that much. His blood and his background. So the teacher is only special because of what the teacher is giving you, what the teacher is teaching you, and what the teacher has been given himself or herself. And that's the Qur'an, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why you got to respect your teacher. It's because your teacher is giving you a gift that has no price. There's no value in it. And as I've said many times before, many masjids, many classes, and subhanAllah, many quote-unquote Somali masjids and duqsis. I've said this and I've given this lecture before about the concept of Quran teachers are oftentimes underpaid, underrespected, undervalued, and overworked. Underpaid, undervalued, undercompensated, and overworked. And there is no one that can do for your child like that which the Quran teacher does, period. The Mu'allim al Qur'an is giving your child a gift that has no price on it. He's teaching your son and your daughter the speech of Allah, Rabbul Alameen. It's nothing that you can give him or her that can compensate for that. And let alone half of the class, half of the halaqah, half of the time at the duksi, I'm telling you, sit down, be respectful, raise your hand, don't throw this. What did he say? It's not a good idea you two sit next to each other. It's not a good idea for you two to sit next That's half of the class. So I'm fighting and struggling, giving so much energy and effort for basic behavior, let alone what am I going to teach you the actual Qur'an and memorization of the Qur'an and the ahkam of the Qur'an. So you can never ever repay the Qur'an teacher as the Qur'an teacher fully deserves. As the Qur'an teacher fully deserves, and that's because the Qur'an teacher is giving you something that has no value in it. And there lies no doubt. If you can memorize the Qur'an, if you can recite the Qur'an, if you know the Qur'an, you can do anything in life. Anything. And that's what I want to talk about today. And that is a hadith which is not necessarily the most authentic hadith. Al Muhim Uruya al Nabi alayhi salatu salam that says, Inna mina shi'ri la hikmatan. From poetry there was wisdom. There's, there's poetry and there are poems which contain hikmah, wisdom, what we were talking about last night. Luqman al Hakim, Luqman the wise. So this hadith it says that from poetry there is hikmah. And as I just have, I just stated, poetry isn't, but this hadith isn't the most authentic. لَيْسَ وَأَصَحْ مَا وَرَدَ عَنِ النَّبِيَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَةُ وَالسَّلَامُ لَكِنْ مَعْنَاهُ صَحِيحٌ But its meaning is correct. وَنَحْنُ نَعْلَمُ جَمِيعًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ لَا يَخْفَاكُمْ طُلَابُ الْإِلْمُ وَالْمَشَايِخُ وَالْعُلَمَاءُ وَالْأَمَّةُ وَالْخُطَبَةُ أَنَّ so the hadith could be weak, but it doesn't mean that it's mean and it's useless. So this hadith it says, Inna mina shi'ri la hikmah. From poetry there is wisdom. Included in poetry is wisdom. And there's another hadith which is more authentic and more well known that says, Inna min al bayani la sihra. Inna min al bayani la sihra. The Prophet والسلام, he says is that there are words and there is eloquence and there is speech which casts a spell, which casts a spell. Sihran, magic, sorcery. A person hears these words, hears this eloquence, and they are spellbound. They're spellbound. The words were so powerful, so profound, so beautifully worded and put together as if he put a spell on me when a person spoke. 
And the ulama of Islam, they differ on what this hadith means. They have two main views in interpreting this narration. Inna min al-bayani la sihran. From one speech, there could be magic. There could be sorcery from a person's tongue. What's meant by this hadith? Some of them, they say, is that this hadith, inna hadha hadith qad kharaja makhraj al-dhammi wa zajar. Is that the Prophet والسلام, is warning us. He's warning us from spellbound people and people who cast spells with their speech. He's warning us. And he's dispraising and he's condemning excessive and unnecessary eloquence. Talking too smoothly, too finely, being too good with your words, don't do that. That's the interpretation number one. And the second interpretation is rather the Prophet ﷺ is praising that the hadith kharaj makhraj al madh wal hath is that the Prophet is calling and inviting people to speak eloquently and to cast spells when they talk, to receive, to give the haq, to deliver the truth in a way which will pierce and pe uh, penetrate the people's ears and their hearts. As Allah Azawajal says, uh, he, he spoke about the munafiqeen. These people, Allah knows what's in their hearts. So turn away from them. But at the same time, admonish them. And give them a word which is baligh, which will reach their hearts. Tell them, shake them up with your words. Give them a warning, a final warning. Okay? And we all know that the Messenger of Allah, when he spoke to the Sahaba, and they felt that it was a farewell speech, and rather than Sariya, he says, As if it was the last talk that you're giving to us, O Messenger of Allah. He says, huh? He says that the, 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 we start to cry, and it pierced our hearts because it was so profound. So the hadith says, Inna min al bayani na sihran. There are some words, and there's eloquence, and there's speech, and there's poetry, which as if it's a spell on you. It's so strong and it's so powerful. So what, where am I going, brothers and sisters? Am I just talking? Am I just dancing around, spinning around, circumambulating, wasting time, burning time, and killing time? No. I'm trying to make a very, very important point. And it's the only thing that I want to talk about today, bi idhin ta'ala. And that is, is that there are poems, and that there is poetry, which contains a great deal of wisdom. And from that poetry, and from those words that I want to share with you, is a basic, simple one-liner. A man, he says, or he used to say, فَكُنْ رَجُلًا رِجْلُهُ فِي الثُّرَى أو رِجْلُهُ فِي الثُّرَى وَهَامَتُ هَمَّتِهِ فِي الثُّرَيَّةِ فَكُنُّ رَجُلًا رِجْلُهُ فِي الثُرَى وَهَمَّتُ هَمَّتِهِ فِي الثُرَيَّةِ أو كما قال The poet he said Be a man whose legs and whose feet walks upon the earth Be a person whose feet are in the dirt The thura وَهَمَّتُ هَمَّتِهِ فِي الثُرَيَّةِ But the apple of your eye Your aspirations and your goals the bird of your thoughts that flies around and soars around, Fituraya is in the constellations. I.e., sky's the limit. Sky is the limit. Don't dream small. Don't think small. Don't wish small. Don't be on earth. Rather, your mind, your dreams, your goals, your aspirations to be in, the, in space, in the constellations. And as we say in English, and in other forms of poetry, sky's the limit. Meaning, there's nothing that you can't be and there's nothing that you can't do. You don't have to just take this job, or follow this career, or do what your father did, or what your mother did, or because I come from this country, I can only be this. And because I come from this uh, background, I can only do that. And because I'm a woman, I can only do this. And because I'm young, I can only achieve this. And this is the best that I can do, and the biggest that I can be. No, don't be like that. Be a man whose feet are upon the earth, meaning you're a human being. You're not extraterrestrial, you're a human being. But your thoughts should be what? Extraterrestrial. Your thoughts should be in space. Sky is the limit. So you got to dream big. You got to want big. 
You have to have the vision. You have to have the aspiration to be something in life. And if you're just pleased with just, you know, yeah, you know, just being average and I don't want to be nothing special. I don't want to do nothing special. I don't want to go no special place. Then you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. You have, to, you have to have aspirations. You have to have goals in life. Whether they're religious goals, religious aspirations. You want to be an alim. You want to be an imam. You want to be a qadi. You want to be a mufti. You want to be this one. You want to be that. Wallahi, by Allah's permission, it's possible. And it's easy. As the Prophet says, it's easy upon those whom Allah makes it easy. For Allah, Allah, He tells us about those who do the right thing. And they practice what they're supposed to practice. And they believe. Allah says, yusra." We will make it easy for them. We will give them facilitation and ease. So if you want to do the right thing, and if you want to tread the path and the religion to be something special, and to be something great, Wallahi, it's permissible. And it's possible. What do you think Ibn Taymiyyah's dreams and aspirations were like? Do you think he wanted to be an average person? Honestly, sit down and ask yourself, do you think Ibn Taymiyyah just thought about being an average Tom, Dick, and Joe person of his time? Do you think he became what he became with low aspirations? Of course not. He saw what was going on with the Muslims. He saw what was going on in Syria. He saw what was going on in his environment and surroundings, and he knew that a change had to be made. And there had to come a time, and Allah knows best, in which he knew, in which he believed that Allah had chosen me for this. And it's time to fulfill my destiny. And the same applies to Ibn Qayyim and other great mountains of Islam, the geniuses of Islam. And the same applies to the worldly life. There's nothing wrong with you being successful in the worldly life. When we tell the people to learn the deen, to learn hadith, to study the Quran, it doesn't mean that you can't be successful in the world. It doesn't mean that. There's nothing wrong with being an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. Or, it's nothing wrong with that. Because when I get sick, I make the adhkar, insha'Allah, and the, the prophetic medicine, and you try to do the spiritual healing. But when I'm really sick, where do I go? I don't go to a mufti. I don't go to a qadi. I don't go to an imam. I go to a doctor. When I have legal problems, I have issues with the law, problems with the law, I'm not going to a mufti or a qadi or a sheikh or an imam. I'm going to a lawyer, an attorney. What heck is that? I look to buy a car. I look to buy a house. I go to the people of speciality. And this is included in the law statement, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْرَمُونَ I ask the people of dhikr if you don't know. And this word, dhikr means many things. And from that which it means is ask the specialists. Ask those who are specialists when you need to know. So if I need something out of the worldly life, I'll come to you, inshaAllah. There's nothing wrong with that. But the best thing to do, the best thing to be, the greatest and the highest, the constellations of thurayya, there lies no doubt, is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهِ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ The people who fear Allah at the highest level are those who have the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's my message to you. I don't wish to give you no long lecture, no long speech. My message is to believe in yourselves بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى You can do it with Allah's help and with Allah's permission. And if you have a tight relationship with Allah, a strong relationship with your Creator, and your deity of worship, Allah Azza wa Jal, nothing is impossible and nothing is too far and beyond your reach, but you got to believe in it. And you got to have aspirations. You got to want it right now. And all of the great people in the deen and in the dunya, you read about their lives and how they became such great and big champions. They'll tell you that it started when I was six years old. It started when I was five years old. It started when I was three years old. It started when I was 10 years old. It started when I was 15 years old. You can't wait until you're a grown man and say, this is what I want to be. You can't wait until you're uh, married with children and say, I, I, I want to do this. I want to go overseas and study. No. It has to start right now. So you have to believe in yourself by Allah's permission. And the moment that you make an effort and you work hard and you do it the proper way, Allah is going to make it easy for you. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبَلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ those who work hard and who strive for our cause, we will, we will lead them to the right path. And Allah is with the muhsineen. Allah will be with you, protect you, keep you safe, to guide you, to instruct you. Allah will be with you, if you make the necessary effort 
to go towards Allah, the mighty and the most high. Hadith Al-Qudsi says, and if my servant comes to me walking, I will come to him running. Just listen to this hadith. If my servant comes to me walking, making an effort, I will come to him with more. So you have to be mindful of this, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, not just the brothers, the sisters as well. You got to believe in yourself. You have to dream. You have to aspire. You can't be low. Don't have your thoughts in the dirt on the earth. The only thing that belongs on the dirt or the earth is your what? Your feet. And your thoughts should be where? In the sky, in the stars. Sky is the limit. May Allah Azza wa bless each and every one of you. Be mindful of your age. Youth is a blessing. But before you know it, it's going to go away. Be mindful of what you do at this young age. And he who respects his teacher respects himself. He who respects his teacher respects himself. And if you show your teachers respect now, when you get older, the people who are under you and beneath you, they will respect you. Inshallah, if there are any questions or comments, the floor is open for anyone that would like to say anything or add anything or ask any questions on a topic or off the topic, which is Akumallahu Khairan. Father how can I improve as a teacher in the Quran? How can you improve as a teacher in the Quran? First and foremost is that you have to realize the tremendous weight that is upon your shoulders. The tremendous weight. And most of us, we don't realize the tremendous weight that is upon our shoulders. And I would say from my personal experiences, unfortunately, sometimes non-Muslims understand certain things more than some Muslims. It's a reality. Let's keep it real for a second. You talk about traveling. And you talk about airport security, border patrol, FBI, whatever uh, uh, entity or whatever agency there is. Why do they bother certain people so much? What have you done wrong? What have you, have you trained in this place? Did you go to this country? Have you ever broken any laws? Do they have evidence of you training how to make violence against people and blow things up? And no, you haven't done any of those things, period. And they know that more than you do. They have access to your life, to your files, the social media. They know what you're talking about. They know what you're calling to. And they know what you're not talking about, what you're not calling to. However, we must, keep a very close tab on you and watch you and put pressure on you. And it has to be a tight squeeze when you travel and that's because you have so much of an influence. You go from city to city, state to state, country to country, and every single mosque is packed and full of people. A hundred people, 500 people, a thousand people, 2,000 people. People listen and watch you from all around the world. If you wanted to call to something or say this or propagate that, it would be a huge problem. So they know the weight that is on you and the weight and the power and the influence and impact of your da'wah. And oftentimes Muslims don't even realize that as much as the non-Muslims. I'm making this up, Is the reason why you agree with that or not? They know. They know who you, who you can touch and reach. So therefore, we have to do things a certain way. You're not an average pa passenger. You're not an average traveler. You're not going to San Diego to get a tan and to sit on a beach with sunglasses. You're going to San Diego to speak to people, to talk to people, to influence people. So therefore, we have to let you know that what? What you're doing is very serious. And it isn't to be taken lightly. Everyone understand the point I'm trying to get to? And oftentimes Muslims, they don't even realize it as much themselves. So just look what Allah has given you. Allah has placed you in charge of the young Muslims. He has given you the hearts, the minds of the young Muslims of the next generation. They come and they sit at your feet and they're willing to take your instruction. That's serious. It's not a small, easy thing. And if you wanted to teach them something bad, if you wanted to corrupt them, if you wanted to pervert them, if you wanted to distort them and take them away from their fitrah, you would have the what? The power to do so. And before the parents would realize what you're doing or the other speakers realize what you're doing, you would have, you would have done what? You've done it already. Even if they take you away from it, you've infected them with your poison already. Serious. So you have to realize being a Qur'an teacher is a tremendous responsibility. 
And it's something very weighty on you. You have to realize that. And the more the responsibility and the heavier the weight, the more the reward, the greater the reward, and the higher is the honor. So that's first and foremost, alayka and tastashir. You got to realize how great it is. The moment that you realize the seriousness of what you're doing and what Allah has placed in front of you, it makes it easier to deal with it accordingly. It makes it easier to deal with something accordingly. The more expensive the gym is, the more security there is in a museum. The older the artifact is, the harder it is to come by across this artifact. This thing's worth millions and millions of dollars. The security in the museum is going to be at its pinnacle. And that's because this thing is extremely costly, rare, and precious. As far as something that can be replaced, something that isn't that hard to come by, something that's average and mediocre, then the security will be accordingly. So the more that you know about the thing, the easier it is for you to deal with it, what? Accordingly. So if you realize that being in Quran teaches a tremendous job and responsibility, and step number two is it makes it easier for you to navigate. How am I going to be a better Quran teacher? Step number three is that you have to have a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to go back to Allah, stay connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and ask Him to make it easy for you to do it successfully. Step number four is learn from those who came before you. Take their experiences, take their wisdoms, and very importantly, brothers and sisters, learn from their mistakes and avoid their mistakes. No disrespect to anyone, but some of the older brothers or some of the old school Quranic teachers, they were great teachers, but perhaps they were too harsh. Maybe they used the stick too much, a bit too much. And some of the youth who grew up in the Duxi and they learned the Quran, they, they memorized it perfectly, but they didn't want to recite it and practice and read it because of those marks and that pain of that stick. So therefore, hypothetically speaking, I have a stick, but the stick is just there as a reminder and as a warning. And that's the last result. As method, I'm speaking hypothetically. You see what I'm saying to you? You can't just take everything from the previous teachers as the Yani Musallam. No, there are older brothers and sisters who made mistakes. And they may have went too much, too hard in the area. You, as a new generation, you gotta learn how to take the good and avoid their shortcomings. And that's extremely important, brothers and sisters. It's take the wisdom for free. Learn from those who came before you and avoid their errors and their mistakes. And of course they made errors and they made mistakes because they are human beings. With all the good that they did, they're still what? They're still they're sons of Adam. The next step after that, Bidinai Ta'ala, is you have to uh, realize that once you win the love, the trust, the respect, and sometimes the fear of your student, you can teach them anything. And the moment you don't have that love, you don't have that trust, you don't have that respect, and there's no fear whatsoever, then it's very difficult to teach them basic rules of ahkam nuna sakina. Almost impossible if they don't love you, if they don't look up to you, if they don't feel that there's a bond in their relationship, and if they don't realize if you cross the line, there are consequences if you cross on that line of respect or not doing your homework. It doesn't all have to be physical. I'm not going to hit you, I'm not going to beat you, I'm not going to do anything to you. But know for sure your smartphone will be taken away. Know for sure you won't play video games. Know for sure that the whole entire class will have what? Halal pizza, huh? Right? And you'll sit and drink uh, al aswadain, dates and water. That's worse than getting a beaten. In my book, if we have a pizza party and you're sitting there and you have what? Tafadl. Uh, there's some ajwa dates and what? Some zamzam. It's better for you, of course, the baraka, but who's going to want dates and water when the rest of the class is eating what? Halal pizza, we said. Not just pizza, huh? Halal pizza, right, Mahavia? <laughs> Tell you. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think that these are things that you have to focus on and, and, and look into. How to get your students to love you. How to get your students to respect you. How to get your students to trust you. And there always has to be that what? That line. As it states in some hadiths, عَلِّقَ sota حَيْثُ يَرَاهُ أَهْلُ bait. They say, hang the whip where the people can see it. Hang the stick where what? Where the people can see it. Meaning it's there. And inshallah, I won't have to pick it up. I don't want to pick it up. But know for sure that what? It's there. Everyone understand this concept? So it has to be a blend. Love, I said. Respect. Trust. And it has to be a pinch of what? 
no, no question about that. And this is one of the most important principles of life, is good doers must be rewarded, and bad doers must be punished. Everyone understand this? So you have to have a mixture. Iron discipline, along with a huge loving heart. And have the ability, be in the to mix it up. And your students, they feel good when they sit with you. And they look forward to your class, inshallah. And it's not a punishment. But they know for sure that if they do the wrong thing, it what? Without a question. And with the law is all success. Fadl ya akhi. How can you be a better student in the Qur'an? Like I just mentioned, is to realize what's being given to you. You're not studying an average book. You're not studying a storybook. You're not studying something made up. You're not studying something which is just for a time or a place. You're studying the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Qur'an. Allah's message to all humans. All jinn. You're studying something which is the miracle of the Prophet sallallahu It was the ayah that he was given. The sign that he was given. Everyone understand this? This is tremendous. So why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you sit the way you sit? Why are you playing and laughing, being disrespectful, and you're studying Allah's words? So you have to realize that it's serious what you're getting. That's first and foremost. Secondly is, is that you have to realize, is that being a good Quran student is going to benefit you and it's going to help you in all other aspects of life. So what do most Muslims want to be Oftentimes they say, I want to play basketball. I want to be like this player and I want to be like that player. I want to be like this point guard and this one and this shooter. I want to be like this and like that. Most of the youth, wherever you go, the Muslim people love basketball. They worship basketball. I'm going to say, how many matches have we been to? Basketball. They love basketball. There's no question about that. So what are some of the parallels between being a good basketball player and being a good student of Quran? Coming on time. Coming early. Making no excuses. Why didn't you come to practice? Why did you miss this shot? How did you lose the game? You lost the series. There's no excuse. We lost the last game. I missed the shot, but I guarantee you the next game, I'm going to make the shot. And I'm going to be there on time. And we're going, to, we're going to win. So don't make excuses when you come as a Quran student. Oh, the cat ate my homework. Uh, uh, I couldn't memorize because, you know, I was tired. And, um, you know, my ummi said, in my, there's no excuse. You were supposed to memorize this line, this Page, that is what you bring to the Qur'an teacher, period. And the moment you make for yourself this standard, you become better in all aspects of life. And no one likes an excuse maker, nobody. They don't like people that make excuses, they like people that make results. So this is something that you learn, inshallah ta'ala, by being a Qur'an student, is make for yourself a standard in which you never ever fall under. You understand these words? Also, bi'idhna ta'ala, is have good friends. If you know there are chatterboxes in the class, people who play around, class clowns, they laugh, they joke, they just want to waste time, stay away from them, avoid them. Make friends and keep company with the serious students and the talented students. And inshallah ta'ala develop a love for the Qur'an and his recitation and his memorization. And yani, last but not least, is just think about what you're going to do for your parents. Think how pleased they're going to be, how happy they are when you've done the right thing. And they work hard. And they sacrifice and they spend their money for you to have a better life. Why would you want to waste it? So these are some of the reasons of behind being a good Quran student. And of course, first and foremost, is Allah Azza wa giving you the success. You're asking Allah to make you a better student. And that's why I said, Al-Isti'ana to Billah. It's seeking help with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows best. Fadda Go. I see my bodyguard. <laughs> Allah Akbar, huh? <laughs> is he my bodyguard? What do you think? You think he is? Well, I guess he's my bodyguard. No problem. Next question. Are there any other questions? Are there questions from the sisters? Father Akhi. question says, if you grew up worshiping Allah, and you'll be from, inshallah, those who will receive the shade of Allah on Yom Al-Qiyamah, does it mean that you can't mess up? Of course not. No, it doesn't mean that. And the Prophet never said that. Shabun nasha'afi ibadati rabbi. He grew up worshiping Allah. It doesn't mean that he was perfect. But it means that he was righteous. 
and he or she strive to do the right thing. Try to do the right thing. The Arabs, they have a very famous statement. They say, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ جَوَادٍ كَبْوَى بَلْ كَبَوَاتٍ They say, every thoroughbred misses a gallop every now and then. A thoroughbred horse, a race horse, a horse that's bred to be the best of the best. Every now and then, this thoroughbred horse, it does what? It misses a gallop. Meaning, it misses a step. And it doesn't mean that it's no longer a thoroughbred horse. So being righteous, being pious, being connected with the law, it doesn't mean that you're an angel. It doesn't mean that you don't make any mistake. But how many mistakes do you make? And how often do you make those mistakes? Just like the NBA. He's a champion. It doesn't mean he never missed a shot. It doesn't mean he never missed a layup or a free throw. But he doesn't do it over and over again. It doesn't happen but so often. It's a rarity for him to miss that shot. It's a rarity for him to make this fundamental error and mistake. That's what's meant by that. So therefore, you growing up in the United States, you may make a mistake. You may slip. You may fall down. But how fast do you get back up? How quick do you get back into it? That's what's important. And you stay consistent, inshallah ta'ala. And you aim for the bullseye, and you may get a seven. You may get an eight. You may get a, you may get a seven and a half. But you have to aim for perfection. Hmm? And the law knows best. Fadr, akhi. All the way in the back with the camouflage. You. How can you be a what? A better student. Like, like, huh? Right, like he just said. How can you be a better student? Is to ask Allah to make you a better student, first and foremost. Secondly, listen to your teacher. Trust your teacher. It's a reason why he's a teacher. It's a reason why he's a teacher. And there are some people who say, or they have said, I'm talking about martial arts. And they ask the question. And they say, do you know the difference between a master and a student? Do you know the difference between a grandmaster and a student? Is it how old he is or what color he has on or what he's wearing? No, 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 no. They say the master has failed more times than the student has tried. The master has failed more times than you've even tried. Meaning the teacher has experience. The mistakes, the f shortcomings, the flaws, he's, he, he did that 20, 30 years ago. So listen to your teacher. Trust your teacher. Listen to what your teacher tells you. If your teacher tells you that you can do better, believe in yourself that you can do better. If your teacher tells you that you're not trying hard enough, don't say, I am. I am trying. Because your teacher wouldn't tell you that if you weren't trying your best. So one of the best ways of being a good student is being a good listener. Being a good listener. Being obedient, being respectful, and trusting your instructor. Inshallah ta'ala. And Allah knows best. Fadr Akhi. What can you take from this khutbah and implement it in our daily lives like today? Before I started the talk, before we made Salat al-Dhuhr, this young brother, he came up to me. And he said, weren't you the brother who did the talk at Ansar Masjid, such and such, such and such khutbah? I said, yeah. I said, you want me to do the same khutbah here? He says, no. I said, so what would you want me to talk about? He says, nothing. I just want you to know, you know, don't talk about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, what can you take from it? Is that sky's the limit, like I said. Don't put a limit on what you can do and what you can be. Don't put a limit on what you can do and what? What you can be. Have dreams, inshallah. How do you be a better How to be a better sheikh like you? Mal mas'ulu anha bi a'lama min as I don't know. Because I don't consider myself to be a good sheikh and I have to be better. But at the end of the day, if, if you want to know something from what I believe, is that practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Don't stop. If you like something, if you feel that you have a talent at something, if you feel that you're good at something, keep doing it. Practice makes perfect. The first time I gave a speech and the first time I gave a talk, of course it was different than how I speak and how I talk today, and I don't consider myself to be a good speaker like that, honestly. People that are much better than me. But I know for sure is that there has been some development. 
And I can't be totally ungrateful to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and fake humility. Tawadu al-kadib, huh? Nahdhar min hadha shay. You gotta be aware of that. Being so humble in which you're not even keeping it real with yourself anymore. You realize Allah has blessed you with something. You have a talent at something. You've been doing something. You can't be but so humble in which you just reject Allah's blessing. But there's always room for improvement. So what's important is practice makes perfect and keep doing something, inshallah ta'ala, until you get a good amount of confidence at it. And you get your talent is then turned into skill. Your talent is turned into skill. One of the most famous people and one of the most iconic people in pop media was Bruce Lee. There's no question about that. And there's much more than just Kung Fu and martial arts. He was an icon and so many other aspects of pop culture in the media. And he made a famous statement, speaking about his opponents. He says, I don't fear a man who knows 300 kicks. He says, but I fear a man who's practiced one kick 300 times. I don't fear someone who has 300 different kicks. He says, but I fear a person who's practiced one kick 300 times. So stop and think about that now. He's basically telling you is that practice, practice, repetition, repetition, over and over and over and over again until you've mastered that thing and then you do it instinctively and that is one of my keys and one of my tricks that I will share with you of being a good speaker or quote unquote a good sheikh is just keep doing it and I tell this to brothers all of the time coming from Medina coming from overseas how do I speak I don't have confidence I can't do it no one listens to me no one will listen to me because you keep saying that you keep shooting yourself in the foot. Stop talking, stop whining, stop crying, and inshallah ta'ala, pick up the microphone and speak. Bismillah. You've made a mistake, okay. It wasn't that good, okay. No one tuned into your class, okay. But the next class, the third class, the fourth khutbah, and then inshallah, a week, a month, a year, and before you know it, you get better, you have experience. And no one is born to be perfect, all right? So that's my advice to, to you and to anyone who's listening is that if you want to get good at anything, you got to practice. You got to practice. And Allah knows best. How do you achieve being Muslim? That's your question? Well, Allah guides you. Allah chooses Islam for whom He wills. But if you mean how to be a good Muslim and how to be a strong Muslim and a consistent Muslim, as I just said, practice makes perfect. And realizing that you're not perfect. And that you are a human being, and that you're going to make mistakes. But Allah Azawajal is kind, He's merciful, and He loves His servants who realize their mistakes and ask for forgiveness of their mistakes. So how to be a good Muslim is that you practice the fundamentals of Islam. Just think about all of the people that you come in contact with on a daily basis. What's your relationship with your mother? What's your relationship with your father? What's your relationship if you have a blended home? Many people, I don't know, here in San Diego, but in many places, they're blended homes in which a brother was divorced or a sister was divorced and they get remarried. And there's a stepmother or a stepfather. What's your relationship with your stepfather? What's your relationship with your stepmother? Your siblings, your classmates. Just stop and think about the people that you deal with, how you treat them. Think about that. That is, inshallah ta'ala, on the road to you being a better Muslim. Hmm? Inshallah. Fadr akhi. Some of the practical steps of gaining knowledge in the West without going to Medina. A very excellent question, alhamdulillah, and a very practical question. And we have to realize that the world has changed. The human is the same, but the world is, is evolving, it's changing, it's different. I have a student, a uh, pupil of mine in New York City. A couple years back, we did a lecture together. It was at his venue, and he made a very profound statement. He says, ignorance. In 2017, I believe it was in 2017, he says ignorance in 2017 is a choice. Ignorance in 2019, I'm saying to you, is a choice. And it wasn't always like that back in the day. Many people didn't have access to knowledge. Let's say if you were a servant or a slave, you were working all day long, making someone else's riches and money. You didn't have the ability to study and to learn. Or if you weren't a slave, but you were a father and a mother, and you work two and three jobs to put food on the table and to provide for your children 
and to give them basic things. You didn't have time to study and to learn. But now in 2019, knowledge is accessible. You press a button. Rather, you don't have to press a button. You look into the phone, it unlocks for you. Re recognizes your face. And you get knowledge for free. Anywhere you want to go, anywhere you, you, anything you do, you can get in. So first and foremost, as you got to realize, is that Allah has made things available that were never available for people in the past. But as I've just said, the human being can either be energetic, uh, can be uh, motivated, or they can be lazy and lethargic. That would never ever change. People were lazy back in the day, and people are lazy nowadays. People were motivated back in the day, and people can be motivated today. So how much knowledge is available on one website, one YouTube channel? But how much knowledge am I actually learning? So what's important is, is the nafs. You gotta ask Allah Azza wa Jal to allow you to be free from laziness and lethargy. And be idhni lai ta'ala, a practical step, is to realize that the knowledge is out there. And the knowledge wants to be obtained. And that's why some of the ulama, they say, is that there's certain books that sit on the shelf and collect dust and beg and cry to be picked up and opened up. The book begs for attention. Think about this now. Think about if you have a pet, a, a cat, a pet cat, and the cat wants to be petted. The cat purrs, the cat jumps on you. Cats, they'll walk between you and your phone. You ever realize that? You ever see what a cat does that? You're on a screen and the cat will walk in front of the screen. You ever ask yourself why cats do that? It's a reason why they do that. And those who study cats, they say that the cat knows that the phone or the, the screen has your attention and you're not giving it to the cat. So the cat is begging and demanding love and affection. That's ilm, that's a book. The book wants to be picked up. The book wants to be read. The people who present themselves to teach and they explain ilm, they only do it because they want to benefit the people. And they want the people to respect what they give and to honor it and to cherish it. But who's picking it up? Who's watching it? Who's listening? Who's memorizing it? All right, so that's the first practical step. Practical step two is to realize your lifestyle is your lifestyle. How this brother studies is not how you should study because he has a different lifestyle. He's married with children. He lives in this country. He doesn't have your occupation. He isn't your age. You have to have a tailor-made schedule for yourself. And if it's only 30 minutes a day, then I'm to God. 30 minutes a day, I study. An hour a day, you study for an hour a day. And you take small steps, be the next part of Ta'ala. And you learn the usul of ilm, usul of fiqh, mustalah of hadith. You learn usul of tafsir. You learn the usul of the ulum of the Quran and things like this. Huh? And you take those practical small steps and the classes that are available online in Arabic, in English, and other languages. Memorize it, learn it, study it. And if you don't have a personal teacher, then go to a brother in the masjid and say, can I recite this to you? Can I read this to you? Can you test me on this page, please? Can you see if I'm saying it right? And before you know it, one book turns into three books, three books turn into six books, one lecture turns into five lectures, and the next thing you know, you finish the whole entire chunk of it. And then you move on to the next level. And your Arabic is better. Or if you already know Arabic, your Naha is better, or whatever the case may be. And you can learn, and you can be a serious student of knowledge in the United States. And I've seen many brothers, the last thing that I'll say in this, in this answer, I've seen many brothers and sisters who have better work habits, better work ethics than those in Medina, in the middle of the Prophet's masjid, laughing, joking, doing all types of nonsense. And you find brothers in the United States or Canada that are serious to live in. So knowledge knows no geographic location, knowledge knows no race, Knowledge knows no gender, knowledge knows no age. But the hunger and the thirst and the love and the passion, that's something that you have to exert. And Allah knows best. We've devoted many classes and lectures on this, on the practical steps of becoming a real student of knowledge on the channel, and Allah knows best. Inshallah, if you brothers don't mind, perhaps we'll take a few questions from online. Inshallah ta'ala. First is not a question, but is a benefit. Giovanni Pablo. These talks for our youth are so important. May Allah bless you. Furqan Nuruddin, alhamdulillah, youth need good info. Thank you very much. Adam Ibrahim, salamu alaykum, Sheikh. Will Mufti answer questions now? Bi'idhnillah.
was this brother part of the Tupac crew, or am I confusing him with someone else? That's from Fresh Plus. <laughs> Allah knows best. I never met Tupac. I don't know about that. He says, nah, you're talking about Muta Bale. This is Mufti Muhammad Ibn Munir. First time listening to him. Where is he, Where is he a Mufti? Tayyip. MashaAllah, I love when the brother reference hadith rather than their own ideals. May Allah bless you. All right. It says here, listen to this, Abu Sa'id. It says, the Spub's boys were refuting this guy. So I was like, I better go check him out. Huh? <laughs> they, they may not realize that they're doing what? Stabbing themselves with their own daggers. Spub's boys, this is what the person says. Allah Alam, if you know who they are, Alam with him, they may be what? Poking themselves with their own what? Their own knives. You warn from someone, and warning from someone, and nowadays it's just not warning from someone. In most cases, when you warn from someone, it means obsession and infatuation. Are they sadatic? Sadatic? Obsession and infatuation. Your every movement, your every statement, your every lecture, everything you say and you do, the people are obsessed with it. And they try their hardest to pick and to search and to fish and to investigate to make you into some type of crazy monster, mubtadi, evil person who doesn't understand the basics of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You don't understand the basics of Islam. That's what they try to do. And in actuality, it ends up what? The people that they're talking to and addressing say, whoa, well for you to be searching this person and digging into his lectures, he did a thousand lectures and you can only find this and that, maybe let me go check him out and see what he's talking about. Let me go see what he's, you know, is he really this evil Mu'tazili, Jahmi, who doesn't understand the basic principles of Islam? This is a reality now. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا يَحِيقُ الْمَكْرُ سَيُّ إِلَّا بِأَهْلِهِ and Allah Azza wa He also says that Allah, what? لا يهدي كيد الخائنين The plot of the treacherous, Allah does not guide it. So oftentimes people, they warn from someone, and in actuality it does what? It backfires on them. And we can what? We can see that. Huh? Allahu Musta'an. Al-Muhim, at the end of the day, we're not here to talk about that. Question says, 445 people watching, but only like 12 likes. This is selfish. Like the videos, show appreciation, and help for the channel. Tell you, MJ from Sydney, Australia. What does Bukhari mean when he says regarding the narrator fihi nadarun? Is he implying the narrator is metruk? Barakallahu fiqh. Empty cup, full teacup. Tell you, may Allah bless you uh, and all of the disciples and the lands down under. What Bukhari says, Fihi Nadarun, is similar to other statements of Imam al Bukhari regarding the Ruat. And Imam al Bukhari, rahimahullah, and obviously this question is not for everyone. This question isn't for everyone. But we have a mixed audience, as you can see. And there's some brothers and sisters who actually have as'ila ilmiya, yani, real knowledge based questions regarding ilm al hadith. You have to know something about Imam al Bukhari. Imam al Bukhari, kana latif al ta'bir. He is very subtle, very kind, and very soft. And what he said about narrators of hadith. And in today's times, that will be translated to what? A tamir. Bukhari would be a what? Mumayya. He would be a, a watering down type of guy. He's watering down the manhaj. He has to say that he's muhtariq, shaitan. He's a dajjal, kathab, wadda. And he can't just say, sakatu anhu. Fihi nadar. Imam al-Bukhari would say, they kept silent about him. Listen carefully to this lesson. They kept silent about him. But today you have to say what? What's your what? Ma mawqifuka anta minhu. What's your position? I don't know anything about him. I never studied anything with him. I have no idea about Sheikh Fulan, Abu Fulan and Fulani. No. You have to take a position against him. وَمَنْ لَمْ يُبَدِّعْهُ فَهُوَ مُبْتَدِعُ If you don't say he's an innovator, then what? You're an innovator. And Imam al-Bukhari, what would he say? Sakatu anhu. They kept silent about him. I.e., Bukhari would say, what's the point of me talking about him? What's the me endangering myself about attacking the honor of a Muslim if Ahmed, Ibn Ma'in, Ibn al-Madini spoke about him already? So according to these people's standards, Imam al-Bukhari would be a what? He'd be a mumayyah. 
Imam al-Bukhari would be huh, watered down according to their standards. So Imam al-Bukhari, he wasn't like Imam Ahmad. He wasn't like Ibn Ma'in. He wasn't like Abu Hatim, in which they said harsh words about poor narrators. Harsh words, whether they were liars, whether they were innovators, or whether they were extremely weak. But Imam al-Bukhari was very, very subtle in what he said, and he was mindful of what he said. And this is a very important lesson for us today. As if, if this scholar has declared this person to be a mubtadi, why do I have to write a book about him? Lish. Unless you have something that you have to prove in yourselves. In which you have to show that it's not just a personal beef anymore. See, Sheikh Fulan wrote a book about him, and this one and that one, and ten others, so it's not just me and him. Something is very sick and wrong with this mentality today. طيب, Al-Muhim, back to the question, and staying objective to the question, but this is very important issues. Warning the youth from this stuff, this nonsense and this garbage, and the disrespect to Imam Al-Bukhari and Imam Ahmed and the Imam of Hadith. That's هذا هو المقصد. That's my point. Imam Bukhari رحمه الله تعالى says فيه نظرون is not the same as him saying munkar al hadith, in which he's clearly expressing that he's munkar al hadith. لا تهل الرواية عنه لكن فيه نظر لا شك من الفاظ التجريح وليس من الفاظ يعني it's not something which he's praising the narrator. أبدا and it's jarh. There's no question about that. And it could be equal to those uh, other statements of Imam al Bukhari. And it could be different. Every hadith has its own taste. لِكُلِّ حَدِيثٍ ذَوْقُهُ And there are general principles of Imam al-Bukhari and the other ulama regarding al jarh al-Ta'deel and there are special applications of every single narrator. If you're a student of jarh al-Ta'deel, you're going to have to read what the other ulama say about that narrator. And what Imam al-Bukhari said about him in other places and did Imam al-Bukhari narrate from him and mention him in other books as well. There has to be details. Even though there's a general rule of what that statement means, of Imam al-Bukhari and by Imam Ahmed and Ibn Ma'in and the other ulama of al-Jarh wa Ta'deel. Wallahu ta'ala alam, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's metruk, doesn't necessarily mean that, but Imam al-Bukhari could say that about a narrator, and the narrator could be, ha majruh, yani jarh shadid, extremely dispraised and disparaged. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Tayyip, if there are no more questions, then we're going to stop here today. Are there any other questions? Fadal? Question says, is Mufti a title or a name? If I had a quarter for every time I was asked this question. Well, Alam, me personally, I think that it's interchangeable. It's interchangeable. To some people, people call me Mufti as my name. Not Sheikh Mufti, Al Mufti. They say, yo Mufti, what you want to eat for dinner? Yo Mufti, where are we going? Yo Mufti, as if it's a name. And some people think and believe that that's my name by birth. Some brothers have bought plane tickets to Dawah conferences with Mufti in it. Wallahi. And I get to the airport and I can't get on a flight. And there are other people who use it as a nickname. We know that your name is Muhammad, but we call you Mufti. And there are others who use it as a title. On a flyer, they say Sheikh Fulan, Sheikh Fulan, Brother Fulan, and Mufti Muhammad ibn Munir. That's his title. When we were in Malaysia, we went to go visit uh, Dr. Zakir Naik. And uh, we visited him in his apartment, and we got through all of the security and everything, and the protection and whatever. And when we visited him and we start sitting and talking with him, he was saying, he says, I heard this Mufti, Mufti Muhammad ibn Munir, Mufti, I thought it was someone from Pakistan coming to visit me, or someone from India or Bangladesh. You know, and then I realized there's an American brother. And Americans, they say Sheikh or Ustaz or whatever. And only the people from the sub Indian continent, Indo Pak, they see people, they say Mufti, Mufti, Mufti. Meaning that's their honorific title for a knowledgeable and learned person. So it is whatever you want it to be. It is whatever you want it to be. Many people, unfortunately, they get caught up on the name. Only Allah knows the stories I can tell you of <laughs> craziness just from that one nickname, title, name, whatever you want it to be. And the drama that it has brought. <inaudible> These are based off of intentions. Everyone understand this? If it's wrong to have the name or the title or the nickname Mufti, maybe it is. But make sure that you're hating it for the sake of Allah. And I'm not talking about you. And make sure that you don't have that hasad in your heart. You need to focus on your heart. 
and on Yom Al Qiyamah, Allah is not going to ask you about why was this person called Mufti. But He's definitely going to ask you about what? Your Hasid. Huh? And your envy and your baghi and your malice. Wallahu alam. Clear? Wallahu alam. Khairan, inshallah, we'll stop here. Fadl Shaykh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Wa alaykum as This is my last question, inshallah. Fadl Shaykh. Right. Question is regarding the statement that we live in a past 9-11 world. And 9-11 changed the world, let alone the modern world, let alone the United States, for Muslim and non-Muslim alike. And I feel that many of the Muslims' leaders today are in a paralysis in light of the events of 9-11. And it should be the opposite in which we should galvanize ourselves and our situation in light of what happened in 9-11. What do you have to say? What's your opinion coming from New York City? So on and so forth. Well, I agree with you, Sheikh. Probably 90%, if not 100% of what you said, I agree. I concur to that. Is that many people, uh, they are in a mental, physical, spiritual, economic, political paralysis. Broken down, crippled, dilapidated from what has happened. And people run from things, they hide from things, they don't want to talk about things, they don't want to bring up things. But in actuality, they should bring up those things and talk about them and use them for their advantage. I agree with that. And in the Hadith Disciple Playbook or the Hadith Disciple Art of War, our strategies of talking and debating and speaking, that's exactly what we say all of the time. It's to discuss the uncomfortable things. Talk about the uncomfortable topics. Let's bring it up. Let's discuss the Prophet Wasallam's marriage to Aisha. Let's talk about method and jihad in Islam or slavery in Islam. The polemic, problematic, sticky, scratchy, hairy issues that the people want to avoid at all costs. It is a delil for us and not against us. It's a proof that Islam is the truth and not the opposite. And this should be a pivot that we use for da'wah. I agree with you 100% in that. And alhamdulillah, wala fakhri, I need no pride or boasting or bragging. But on my channel, alhamdulillah, we've spoken on many of these issues. And we've spoken on those issues in ways that I don't think too many other speakers have. Whether they are scared or afraid, whether they don't feel like they're qualified or whatever the case may be. But well, we've, alhamdulillah, gotten loose and taken off the gloves on many of these problematic issues instead of running from them and being afraid and scared. So I agree with you 100%, Sheikh. As far as my personal twist and my personal opinion and my view, then me personally, I don't think nothing about 9-11 was an accident or an incident. I don't think it was an accident or an incident. And obviously we live in the United States and we're entitled to freedom of speech, freedom of religion. We can say what we want to say. We can believe what we want to believe as long as it doesn't harm and hurt someone and go against the rules. So I believe that it wasn't an accident. Who did it? Who planted? Allah knows best. We know that the people of evil the people of darkness, they congregate and they come together, no matter where they come from. Arab, black, white, African, whatever you are. If you're upon evil, if you're a worshiper of the shaitan, if you worship Iblis, if you worship Satan, then you come together and you congregate. This is my opinion. Is that it wasn't an accident and it wasn't an incident. It was planned, it was strategized, and they knew exactly what they were doing and they had a purpose. And one of the problems and one of the reasons why we're in a paralysis, as I've said the other day, is that oftentimes we're playing checkers while they're playing chess. If we're even playing checkers. We may not be playing checkers. We may be playing hopscotch. We may be playing something which is even, not saying a hopscotch has no strategy in it. So the concept of people thinking ahead and plotting and planning way ahead, moves ahead. 
This is something that the Quran speaks about. And the Quran clearly mentions in so many ayat. They make a plan, they make a plot, they scheme. This is nothing which is strange. It's not just all conspiracy. This is reality. And there's nothing wrong with us talking about the reality. So let's look at what happened in 9-11. Whether it was a Muslim who did it, a non-Muslim who did it, whether it was a plan, whether it was fake, whatever the case may be. What happened at 9-11? Many people lost their lives. That's a fact. A great amount of property was destroyed. That's what? That's a fact. Many countless people were injured and harmed. That's a what? That's a fact. Who did it? Why they did it? Allah surely knows best. I have my opinion. You have your opinion. And we'll stand in front of Allah. The, the evidence is clear as day. And only and Allah knows best. I don't want to say anything wrong. But I don't see how you can actually believe and just suck up the slop that they feed you in the media. To think that this building fell down and melted down from a plane crashing into it. Basic science, basic engineering, basic common aql. Are you serious? Let alone the other dodgy and dark things and the games that they played and the lies that they made and the fake false apologies that they made and the covering up that they did when the investigation was placed on what happened and how it happened. Where would you like to start with the proofs and the evidences that it was all a, a game? Where would you like to start? The plane, the hijack of the plane, the buildings? Where would you like to begin? What happened, the countries that were invaded, the people that lost their lives, where do you want to start? When you talk about 9-11 and post 9-11, all right, that's first and foremost. So the, the next point and the last thing I'm going to say is, none of that matters right now. Who did it, how it happened, what's important is people died, people lost their lives, people were injured, and a great amount of property was destroyed. And most importantly, or more importantly, is the aftermath of broad brushing the Muslims to be terrorists and the Muslims are violent and the Muslims are extremists and the Muslims and the Muslims and the Muslims alright and the concept of we can invade a country because of what happened in a city and we can conquer and take over our land because of what happened in a city obviously that doesn't make too much sense let alone is that even constitutional what do the people of this country do to deserve to be bombed and destroyed because of what happened in New York City is that the Constitution? Does that even make any sense? So, the last thing I'm going to say, Bidhan Aitala, is what happened on 9-11 and what they try to say that the Muslims are and what Islam is, let's discuss the facts. Let's talk about Islam according to the orthodox sources. And let's talk about terrorism and terrorists according to the scientific sources. What is terrorism? And what is a terrorist act and who is a terrorist? Are the Muslims the only people who do acts of terror? Are the Muslims the ones who make these acts of terror? Now let's talk about Christian terrorism. And let's talk about Jewish terrorism. And let's talk about Zionist terrorism. How many buildings are blown up? And how many children lose their lives in these bombings in the name of Christianity, Judaism, Zionism, or whatever else? So it's so many things that are wrong with what happened during 9-11, after 9-11. So many things wrong. And I think that the Muslims should use that incident, what happened, and talk about facts and the truth. That's it. Facts and the truth, nothing else. And there's no apology needed for facts, and there's no apology needed for the truth. Wherever it is, whoever's talking about, whether the Muslims did it or not, we speak the truth and that's it. And that's the bottom line, that's in brief. We've run out of time, unfortunately. I think that answers your question, hopefully. Wa jazakumullahu khairan.